Yes, hello. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to you. To I'm really looking forward to talking to you about smarketing, what it is, and why you need to master it. Let's have a look. Why do we need to master it? I I say that an underperforming sales and marketing team severely inhibits the success of your business. It really means that sales and marketing have to work together as effectively and as productively as ever before in order to make your business competitive and to make it uh, help grow and to get the most out of your resources. Now, what is marketing? Well, I say that sales and marketing need to work together, so they need to collaborate, so that sales can support marketing insofar as keeping the feedback loop open so that marketing understands exactly what sales uh, needs and what works for sales and what doesn't. And we also want marketing to then support sales using that information that they got from, from sales. So sales helps marketing and marketing helps sales and they're collaborating as one team. That's what marketing is. Now what are some of the problems in the marketplace? Well, he, here are some of the organizations I work with and they're telling me that things like every underperforming sales rep is costing us a fortune in lost sales and wasted leads. They also spend an undue amount of time with the sales manager who then has to coach them and, uh, and guide them through the sales process so that um, um, other sales reps are actually missing out. So what we want is we want every sales rep in the organization to perform at their peak and to really do well for themselves and do well for the organization. Others tell me that our sales and marketing teams have no chance of hitting their sales targets or attaining their sales quota. And that's because they're not working as well together as they could. And others say, we have disconnects that destroy our sales and marketing performance, and we really would like to fix that up so that we can compete in the marketplace. So why do we need marketing, and what does it do for us? Well, if you get marketing right, it produces more sales, more profit. It gives your organization higher productivity and we reduce costs by having less waste. We can attract a higher caliber of talent, particularly salespeople. You think about it, a high-performing salespeople is a sought-after resource. Every organization wants high caliber salespeople having working for them, but because of that, they can choose more or less what employer they will go with. And t let me tell you this, they like to go to places where they're being supported, where they actually have a good chance of being successful and where they're being uh, helped to do well for themselves and for the organization. So. A collaborative organization that supports its people is going to be attracting a much higher caliber of people. The other thing that happens, as I'll show in a minute, is that your customer experience will get much better. You gain loyalty and you gain more sales and you get more repeat business from customers who enjoy doing business with you because you have your sales and your marketing teams collaborating really well. And last, not least, you will get much greater return on your investment in terms of technology, particularly CRM, Salesforce automation, and marketing automation technology, um, and you will get a, a better return on that investment that you put into that um, technology because people will actually want to use it and they will understand why they're using it and they will not resist using it. It all means we'll make more dollars for the business. Now there are three things that I'm going to be talking about, why we need to have some marketing and how we're going to go about it. And the first one we're going to talk about is to align our organization better with the new ways that buyers now purchase. Let's have a look. Gardner says that selling has really changed, uh, particularly in the B2B arena. That cold calling is dying out if it's not already dead, because 90% of decision makers won't even respond to your cold calls. So this notion of uh, I'll just dial more people and then I get more business really doesn't work when 90% of the decision makers won't even take the call. We used to have this notion that there used to be one decision maker and if, if we could only get to them, then we would get our business. But Gardner is dispelling that myth now by saying that on average in B2B, 5.4 people are involved in the buying decision. So it means there is no mystical single decision maker any longer. There's a group of people who have different agendas, different objectives, different ideas that all need to be satisfied in order to make a purchase decision in your favor. So you need to get to those people and you need to have the right language and the right message to each of them individually. 
The other thing is that um, we don't really hunt, well, we still hunt, but we're not successful hunting unless we can hit the buyer and we can stop cold calling them. But 75% of buyers now use social media to find information on vendors, and they more or less come to us. So we may not even know that somebody is out there looking for the things that we sell until they actually come to us and ask. So the landscape of selling has changed, and it's changed quite dramatically, and we need to adjust to the new ways if we want to be successful in business. Now let's have a look at how we used to do business. There used to be something called the sales cycle. I've said here the traditional sales cycle, but it's, it's, it's pretty much becoming a bit per se. And what used to happen is that the sales rep was in charge of the sales cycle. They would drive the process forward. It would be their job to identify the target, to contact the target, maybe through cold calling, to confirm the target's requirements. Are they actually looking for things that we're selling? Do we qualify them in? Do we qualify them out of the sale? Then confirm that um, what we're selling is actually suitable for them, prove our value, negotiate the price, and close the deal. So the sales cycle was driven by the sales rep contacting the client and selling them something. The reason I'm saying this is now dying out is because we've got something called the buyer's journey. And the buyer's journey is something that's uh, only happened over the last few years with the advent of the internet and with a lot more information being available online to actually educate the buyer. And so what they do is they don't contact us first and say, what have you got to sell me? What they do is they go through a whole research phase themselves online where they actually just go, hmm, I think I need something. And then I think I'll jump on the, on, on the internet and have a look at uh, what, what's available to me. Oh, I've got these choices and I can get them probably at that price. Hmm, I better check with some people that already bought from, from these uh, vendors. Uh, I might just do some, some comparison sites and have a look at those. Uh, I think I really like those three or four vendors, so I'll, I'll just contact them and see what um, what they have, and then I'll choose which one I'm going to buy from. So you can see the language has completely changed insofar as it's no longer the sales rep that's in charge of, the, of completing the, the sales cycle. It's now the buyer being on a journey of discovery, discovering you or not discovering you, and then making a purchasing decision pretty much by themselves. And I've said here that up to 90% of decision making is already completed by the time they contact the vendor. So if you're a sales rep in a vendor organization and a buyer comes to you and they've already made up their mind up to 90% of what they're going to buy and what pretty much what price they're going to buy it at, how much of a chance to sell them something different, something, something more expensive, to upsell or to cross-sell them at all? Your, your chances are pretty limited. So what we're saying now is that part of the time of their research they're spending online which is basically the domain of marketing and then once they feel they have enough information to actually contact the vendor then they contact the sales rep and of course they move into the offline world where sales people live and that's why we need some marketing because we want the transition from the online space from the marketing space to the offline space, to the physical contact with the sales rep, to be as seamless and as pleasant as possible. Because we don't want to put the buyer off at the time when they make contact with our sales reps. So we really need to have sales and marketing working together as one, with the same messaging, with the same look and feel, and with the same cultural aspects as each other, so that the buyer will not even notice they've transitioned from the marketing world to the sales world. Oh, I'll just come. I'll just come back to this one here. Something we hear a lot from people in in the the real world is the, in the sales world is that they say, by the time the buyer contacts us, they know they know more about our product than our reps do because they've done their research so well that they're actually very well informed about our products, services, and goods and solutions, and to the point where they actually know more than than our reps do which means that our reps have to change as well because they can't just be salespeople, they have to be subject matter experts in that particular thing that they're selling. And we need to su support them with you know, maybe pre-sales salespeople or 
with um, our own subject matter experts that can jump in and, uh, and help the client out or the, the buyer out when they, uh, when they ask tricky questions. So the, the way the buyer buys has changed, but also the way that we need to address that change and we, the way we need to sell to the buyer has changed also. Which really means that there's been a power shift over the last few years away from the, from the vendors who used to have the information and they used to be able to tell you what the prices they are and you used to have to come to them and, and to their location and find out what's, uh, what's going on. Away now from the old way to the new way of the buyer's journey whereby we can search the internet from our homes and from our offices, we can get all the information that we need, we can find out about your prices and we can find out about uh, where we can buy from you, including online, and the power has shifted to us because we can decide, we can research and then we can choose which vendors we want to contact, not waiting for you to contact us or seeking your advice in the first place. So the power has shifted from the vendors to the buyers. So we've talked about how we need to align our organization better. Now let's have a look at how we need to implement our technology better. Here's a slide from our own research from 2014, 2014, where we looked at what technology do organizations use. So this is research into 185 B2B organizations and we put them into two camps. We said are you a growth organization? In other words, did your revenue grow over the last few years and over the last 12 months? Or did your revenue not grow over the last 12 months? And what we've done here is we've said, what technology do you use in your organization? And then we compared the growth versus the non-growth organizations. And you can see that the non-growth organizations, so the ones that um, didn't grow the revenue over the preceding 12 months, have a lot more technology implemented than the ones that kept it relatively simple and that experienced growth, revenue growth over the preceding 12 months. So we think that the ones that are successful have kept it rel relatively simple, that just having CRM alone is no longer enough, but that buying every piece of technology that's out there is really going to distract you from selling and it's going to be detrimental to the organization in terms of sales results, certainly in the short term. So the recommendation is that you keep your technology deployment fairly focused and fairly simple and you don't overwhelm your own organization with too much all at the same time. But we're spending more money on technology. So here's a chart from 2009 to 2015, and in 2015 we've already grown to 60% of our marketing budget being spent on digital. And Focus Research says that marketing automation has seen the fastest growth of any CRM-related segment in the last five years. So marketing automation is really coming to the fore. Gartner says that by 2020 customers will manage 85% of their relationships without talking to a human. So that means they will not just go to 75 or to 90% of the buyer's journey before contacting a salesperson. They will actually complete 100% of their buying journey without contacting a salesperson. They'll just do it all online. What does that do to salespeople? The Aberdeen Group says nearly 70% of businesses are using a marketing automation platform or currently implementing one. So it's, there's huge momentum in this where we're spending a lot of our money on marketing automation and uh, CRM and Salesforce automation, but what happens to all that investment? Unfortunately, it seems that according to a study by Accenture and the CSO Insights Group, that 85% of organizations that implement uh, automation or uh, business technology to some degree find that 85% of the business technology implementations fail to achieve their stated objective. So flip that around, only fewer than 15% of organizations achieved improved win rates from implementing sales tools, whether they were mobile or otherwise. Th there is a lot of um, emphasis being put out by the vendors at the moment, you've got to be mobile ready, you've got to have mobile this and mobile that. But according to this study, it says that only 15% of organizations achieved improved win rates from rolling out technology. 
more than 85% of organizations did not increase their revenue from technology deployments. So there's an indictment right there. And more than 90% did not reduce the time it takes to close a sale, so did not speed up the sales cycle. It was not a, a sales acceleration success. So we've got to be really careful about how we implement the technology and, and how we can get that return on that technology investment. Now, just let me say that I have absolutely no problem with technology. I'm not against technology. I love technology. I use it myself. But the key is to implement the technology in the right way. I'm going to come to that in a minute. Now, here's another stat from Live Hire. Live Hive, and they're saying that you know we're spending billions of dollars on sales acceleration technology. One point two billion dollars invested in sales tools over the last several years. Thirty billion market. There's a thirty billion dollar market for sales acceleration technology by 2017, and we're spending you know, over two thousand dollars per rep per year on on technology. But look what happens also. Mark Ritson, in, in August of 2015, so only very recently, said, there's a cat and mouse game in suing. There are buyers deploying a new breed of, tech, of ad avoidance software, a new breed of ad avoidance software that is really facing a big challenge to marketers because at the same time, while we're spending all these billions of dollars on sales acceleration technology and on marketing automation and on CRM, technology and we capture the IP addresses of the people that visit our websites and we try to track them down and we try to find out who they are and then send them more information about the products that we sell they're just saying we don't want that we don't want to be spied on we don't want to be fed this thing that we know comes to us only because we've uh, visited your website we want to be contacted by you only when we're ready to be contacted by you and we will decide when we're ready so I'm going to now stop sending out cookies. I'm not going to let you find out where and when and how long for I'm visiting your website and what I'm looking at. I don't want that spying on me. I just want to have a look and I want to be left alone until I'm ready to buy and to contact you or not. So we've got this cat and mouse game whereby the buyers are spending money on being avoided and the vendors are spending money on, on, on tracking the buyers. And it's just really a, a bit of an arms race where each is trying to avoid the other, but spending each is, one's trying to chase the, the other, and the other one's avoiding them. And we're spending more and more money going around in circles for, for the same thing. What's wrong with this picture? I'm going to talk, uh, talk about that in a minute. What's wrong with the picture is that we need to dissolve our departmental silos and we need to start working together as people. Now, let me come to the people part of the equation. Mr. Thomas Allen, who's now with uh, MIT, is a pro professor at, uh, at MIT. In the 70s, he founded something called the Allen Curve. Now, the Allen Curve is a, a purely human observation. So what, what uh, Thomas Allen did was he said, hmm, I wonder how whether the distance between two people has an impact on the frequency of communication. So does it mean that people who are further away from each other communicate less than people who are closer to each other? And he did a whole bunch of research in 1977 and came out with this, uh, with this paper that said that the further people are away from each other, the less they communicate. Now, that makes complete sense, and we would think that's, uh, that's reasonable to so, a reasonable thing to say. But the astonishing thing about the Allen curve is that it's not a linear curve that goes from the top left to the bottom right in a linear fashion. It actually dips right down at the beginning, and then there's a long, long tail of where the collaboration or the communication is uh, fairly constant, but at a very low level. So you can see here that it dips right down in the beginning. Now, I'd like you to have a guess at how far away the people are in the orange part of the curve. So that first bit there where it's um, um, shaded in orange, the communication drops by 75%, let me tell you this. So let me ask you this, how far do you think the people in the orange field are, a, uh, are a, 
away from each other for the communication to drop by 75%. Have you guessed? Here's your answer. 10 yards. 70% or 75% of communication drops within 10 yards. Now, you, you imagine this. You're sitting in a cubicle next to your colleague and you can lean over and you can say, hey, Joe, what do you think of this? And Joe will go, oh, yeah, that's all right or not all right or, you know, whatever. But you get instant communication. Imagine if he's ten, of, of, if Joe's ten yards away, and you've got to get up and walk over there. You know, I, I think I'll know Joe well enough. I think he'll he'll be okay with this. I won't ask him. Now imagine if he's in the next room. Imagine if, if he's on the floor up or down. Imagine if he's in another building. Imagine if he's in another town. You can just imagine that it's it's perfectly human nature for you to go. Ah, no, it'll be okay. I won't ask him, just because it's not convenient to lean over the cubicle wall and say, Hey, Joe, what do you think? You know? So Mr. Thomas Allen came up with this in, in the 70s and he said basically the further people are away from each other the less they talk, which, which is really a good learning for us because what we want is we want an, 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 a culture, an organization where people collaborate and where they do talk and they do communicate and they do work together. So what I say is that if you have good collaboration, you will create a platform for all the other tactical or you know, perhaps even strategic tools to work much better. So if you have a collaboration platform where people are saying, yes, we want to work together and yes, we want to do the best for the organization together, then all your investment in technology will become much more, much better used. It'll become, become more fruitful. Well, your sales training will be better because it's not just uh, going to the sales people. The, the marketing people will understand what the sales training was about and they will then support that. Your social media will be much better because both the salespeople and the marketing people will talk about the same things in the same way. And your power messaging will be much more aligned because sales and marketing are on the same platform, they're on the same page. And all your marketing strategy and tactics will work much better because sales and marketing have actually worked on them together and they've come up with a solution together, they've developed a plan together and they're rolling them out together. They own the solution, they are the solution, they are collaborating. So you can see how just having the people mindset to collaborate, having a collaboration mindset will just amplify all the other uh, things that you put on top of that platform just um, by, by an order of magnitude. What's the flip side? Here's another few quotes. IDC says, only 25% of sales leads and collateral that marketing creates is ever used by sales teams. What does that mean? It means 75% of the stuff that marketing creates is not used by the salespeople. What a waste of time, effort, resources and money that is. Imagine how frustrating it is for marketing to create content that sales doesn't use. Imagine for fr how frustrating it is for sales to be given content that they can't use or they feel is not right. And how frustrating it must be for sales to feel that marketing is not listening to them. CSO Insight says, only 35% of a sales rep's time is spent on selling. 35% of a sales rep's time is spent on selling. That means 65% of a sales rep's time is spent not spent on selling. So there's something distracting them, there's something taking away, stealing their time and stealing their effort to attain their sales quotas. The task group says 67%, so that's two-thirds of sales professionals do not achieve the personal sales quota. Well, if you look at the other two statistics, you kind of say, well, it's not really that much of a surprise because they're kind of starting off the foot race with, um, with only one shoe on. So let's have a look. What are they spending their time on? This is again from our own research in 2014 when we asked the question, how much time do you spend either looking for or modifying marketing content? So we asked the sales reps, how much of your time do you spend either looking for or modifying marketing content? Have you ever heard a sales rep say, man, I can't find that white paper I'm looking for. You know, it would be really good to send that to my prospect, but I just can't find it. Ah. But I think I remember what it, what it said, so I think I'll, I'll, just, um, I'll just create my own and send that to the client. Imagine how happy the marketing people are if, uh, if the salespeople create their own content. But the statistics are in. 
the statistics say that over half of the surveyed reps spend between 10% and 30% of their time either looking for or modifying marketing content. Now imagine if that time was recouped, if they had that time back, how much more they could sell. Now there are some reps that spend less than 10% of time, but there are others that spend more than 50% of their time, as you can see in the bar charts here. But if you apply the right weighting across the range, for all the sales reps together, you come up with the average of 17% of their time is spent looking for or modifying marketing content. So I want to run a little exercise with you now. What if we ignored these statistics and we did nothing? What would the cost to the organization be if we just go, ah, oh, no, we don't believe it, or no, nah, it's too hard, or no, nah, we don't want to do it, or no, nah, our sales reps won't respond to it. What would be the cost of doing nothing if 17% of your salespeople's time is lost to either looking for or selling or, 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 or creating their own marketing content? You can calculate this for yourselves. Get out your smartphone or your tablet or just get a piece of um, paper and a, and a pen and calculate this. Total number of our reps, so how many sales reps do we have, times what they cost us per year, so this is the total remuneration cost, not their salary, not their wages, not their commission. This is the total cost to the organization per rep per year. And then multiply the, the number of reps by the total cost of, of uh, employing the rep per year times 17%, and you get the figure of wasted effort and resources that in your very own organization. So you run this formula for yourself, and you can find the figure for your own organization. Now, for illustration purposes, I've actually run a sample calculation here. So let's say we have an organization with 50 sales reps who earn $150,000 per year, sorry, who cost the organization $150,000 per year. And if we multiply that by 17%, we get $1.275 million per year that's lost in time where the sales reps are just looking for or creating their own content. So you could actually save over a over million dollars a year if you had the content available at the right time, in the right format, in the right place, and the right content to the sales rep. But this is not the end of the story. It goes on. There's an opportunity cost in the lost sales of a rep. So let's say each one of our 50 reps has a sales quota of $1 million per year. If we now find that 17% um, of the sales are not taking place because they're doing other things with that time, it actually comes to $8.5 million that we're not earning due to the time not spent on selling by the sales rep because they're being distracted, playing marketing. Put the two figures together and you end up with nearly $10 million for the organization every year. That's uh, uh, money out the window, money down the drain because we're not giving the salespeople our best support and because they're not uh, telling marketing what uh, marketing really needs to hear. So there's enormous room for improvement just in this little statistic alone. There's many others, um, but just in this little statistic alone says it's really worth spending time and looking at marketing. And here's again a, a, a bit of a graph from the research we conducted in 2014. And basically we looked at all the growth organizations together and all the non-growth organizations together and we said to the salespeople separately, to the marketing people separately, there are 14 things you should have in place between sales and marketing to make you collaborate. Do you have these things in your organization in place, yes or no? And the orange are the results of the, the marketing people responding and the gray lines are the ones of the salespeople responding. Now, the way to interpret this, this graph is the more the two meet in the middle, the more aligned they are. Now, without knowing what those 14 items are, you can see in one glance that the growth organizations are much more aligned than the non-growth organization. They're actually collaborating and they're doing a much better job working together. How much better? We looked at that as well. And basically what it came down to is that 
if you are in an organization that has its sales and marketing teams collaborating and working well together, you are not just 10%, not just 20%, not even 30% more likely. You are twice as likely, 100% more likely, to be financially successful. So there's a direct correlation now between sales and marketing collaboration, so the, the sales and marketing teams working together, and the financial success of the organization. And it's double the difference. You know, they're, they're, they're much better than casino bets. If your sales and marketing team work together effectively, you're twice as likely to be financially successful than otherwise. Twice as likely. Now, what would happen with that uh, with that money? So here's something that uh, a, a, um, from the Harvard Business School in 1992, these two people, uh, Steve Hindman and John Sviokla, came up with this formula, and they said, let's have a look at what difference five percent can make to the bottom line if we just tweak one parameter in the in the sales process. So we've got a base case here that says we're, we're selling something for $100. It costs us $60 to buy, so we make $40 gross profit. We have some fixed cost and ka-ching, ka -ching, down the bottom it comes out. We're making $10 on the, our $100 sale, which is a, a margin of 10%. So that's our base case. Now let's have a look. If we say we will reduce our direct selling expenses by 5%, so again, we're going to compare 5%. If we reduce our direct selling expenses by 5%, so we tell the reps not to take the client out to lunch or dinner, and we're not spending as much money on acquiring the, cu the customer, we're d reducing our direct selling expenses by 5%, it actually makes not a lot of difference to the bottom line. You can see it 5% uh, reduction in expenses only brings our profit up by about 3%. So not really effective to tell the sales rep not to take the client out to dinner. What's much more effective is if we get the sales rep to sell more. So in our calculation here, instead of selling um, something for $100, we're selling $105 worth of product. It costs us a bit more because we're, we're selling more, so we've got to buy more. Our direct uh, expenses are the same, but because of the 5% that we've more that we've sold, or 5% faster that we've sold, we're now getting $12 instead of $10 at, at our um, profit before tax, which is a 20% improvement in profitability. So what uh, Heinemann and Sviokla said was that a 5% improvement in sales volume or in sales productivity means a 20% improvement in, in bottom line profitability, which is a four times profit multiplier. So increasing the sales volume or the, or the the speed of sale has a, an enormous benefit and enormous impact on our bottom line. So we, that's what we want our salespeople to do. Now there's another interesting case here. Have a look at why your financial controller, your CFO, insist on you raising your prices all the time. Because if we raise our price by just 5%, it actually means a 50% improvement to the bottom line, given the margins that we've got here. So what that means is that raising your price is even more effective than improving your sales productivity. So it sounds like the ideal solution, but the reality is that in, in a hyper-competitive world that we're in today, it's really, really unlikely that you'd be actually able to sell, to, um, sell something at just 5% more when your competitors aren't. And so the more likely scenario is actually for your salespeople to become more effective and to in increase either the velocity of their sale or the quantity of their sale um, by 5%, and that still makes a 20% improvement to the bottom line, so it's still not a bad result, really. So you can see how massive a difference just a 5% improvement can make on an organization. So, so imagine if sales and marketing working together as, a, as one team in unison can have that sort of effect on your organization, it would be really, really worth looking into. The question is then, if we decide, yes, we want to improve our sales and marketing collaboration, how do we do it? And what we want to do is we want to create an environment where the salespeople talking to the customers, the marketing people are talking to the customers, and they're talking to each other. So they're supporting each other, sales helps marketing, and marketing helps sales, and the customer has a, 
um, consistent buyer's journey experience. In the end, what we want is actually for sales and marketing to be so in unison that they're indistinguishable from each other from the, looking at it from the outside. So I've signified that here by sales and marketing being in a, in a yin and yang type scenario where they look to the customer from the outside as one, but on the inside each knows exactly what their roles are and how they can support the other. I've got a different diagram down here where, where I've, I've said there are organizations that have a silo mindset or a silo mentality where their salespeople and the marketing people are working in their own silos, in their own departments, and they're not talking to each other. And I call it a silo mindset, a silo mentality. Next thing is there's been a lot of talk about sales and marketing alignment. Now, I don't actually like the term sales and marketing alignment because it's a bit one-dimensional and a bit narrow and a bit weak. I like the term sales and marketing collaboration because alignment to me is mainly around our marketing will create a lead, sales and marketing have agreed on what the need, what the sales lead needs to look like so that um, sales actually accepts it, then marketing hands the lead over to sales, sales may or may not follow it up and then may or may not report back to marketing about what's, what's happened to the lead and how many has it, have actually gone through to a sale. Now, that to me is not collaboration. That's just having agreed on the process and, uh, and maybe more or less following the process. True collaboration is where sales and marketing instinctively and inherently want to work together as one team for the betterment of each other and for the betterment of the organization. And again, I've signified that here in this yin and yang arrangement. Now, if you're curious about how to do that, then it's not something that you start off with technology. So this is where I come back to what I said um, earlier that um, we need to implement the technology in the right way. A lot of organizations start off with the technology, impose it on the users, and then wonder why they're not using it. Often you hear the IT team then saying, oh, we're not getting the utilization rate on our CRM. We need to run more training for the users, as if that's the solution. The solution actually is that you, you benchmark where your people sit today where, whether they are in a silo mindset, in a process mindset, or even in a collaboration mindset, and you take it from there and you say, yes, we want to work more effectively together. And I say there is actually a spectrum of collaboration that helps this, the teams to understand where they sit today. It also helps to benchmark, um, run a bit of a line in the sand to say, where, um, how do we know we're improving? But the main thing is that what we want to do is we want to get the people to agree that working together is a good thing in the first place. Once you've crossed that threshold, then you can say, okay, how do we want to work together? So we're now talking about our processes, our metrics, our KPIs, and then we can coach the teams on becoming the solution and being the solution, and then they will not mind having technology provided to them that actually supports the process that they've uh, agreed amongst each other. And the technology also helps to make the collaboration extend over distance. So here comes the Allen curve into play again, where we're, whereby we're saying the technology can actually help to overcome some of the obstacles, some of the human nature resistance that we have to collaborating over distance, to make the collaboration extend beyond head office into the regions, and to make it sustainable, so that it just doesn't rely on the heroic effort of some individuals, but it actually becomes baked into the, into the culture of the organization and the way we do things around here. So I'm a very strong advocate of having people first, processes second, and technology third. So technology to support the processes, technology to, to, to support the people, not technology to be the solution in its own right and, uh, and being the panacea that you magically install and things will come good all of a sudden. Not the case. We need the people to agree that they want to work together, how they want to work together, and then support them with the technology. And that really works. It needs to be a holistic approach. So we've talked about the benefits of marketing before. To end, I'm just going to give you three examples of where that's actually happened. So here's a multinational manufacturing organization. By applying marketing principles, their sales improved by, by 8%. Their profit in, in improved, we think, by at least 14%, but possibly more. They wouldn't tell us, so that's, uh, that's a bit of a guess there. 
They had less waste and we managed to give them cost savings of 7%. They have much better reps and, and sales managers now in their organization. Their click-through rate went up by 11%, which we say is much better, is due to much better um, customer experience. And they, their forecast accuracy jumped up by 23%, which is a much better improvement on the um, investment that they've undertaken in their technology. So all around, really, really good figures. Here's another example. A not-for-profit organization. They'd say, wow, what's a not-for-profit organization doing here? But they also have sales, and they also have profit, and profits, and they also have um, waste in the organization. So we managed to reduce their sales, uh, their waste by 8%. We increased their sales by 16%. Their profit went up by a staggering 21%. Mind you, they had to replace a lot of the reps and a lot of the managers because um, they just didn't uh, come up to the new paradigm. They just wanted to keep the old world, and uh, there was nothing the CEO could do. They had to replace some of the people. But their customer engagement has jumped up um, by 21%. And they've in installed a collaboration app that we supplied them with for the first time, and they're going really gangbusters with that. A really successful story, a really good success story here. The last one is an, an Australian technology firm. Now, they their sales increased by 11%. That's what we know. They didn't tell us their profit figures, but we think it's more, more than 11%. Their cost savings were 4%, so we, got, we reduced their waste. They replaced 20% of their reps with better reps, and better, and they got better managers as well, better sales managers, so that uh, increased the, um, the sales revenue again. They're getting up 8% up uh, on their repeat business from the previous year, so that's uh, due to best, better customer experience. And their CRM utilization rate has gone up by a staggering 26%, so the people are actually happy now or happier now, used to use the CRM than before, which is what gives them the return on the investment that they've undertaken in technology. So phenomenal results. So to come back again full circle, I said at the beginning, an under-collaborative sales and marketing team undermines your business from within. So this is a, a, a variation on that theme from the beginning, but it's pretty much true that if your sales and your marketing teams don't work effectively together, you actually have undermining of your own business from within. It's pretty hard doing business today anyway. You've got competition from all sides of um, angles. But, but if, you, if you have no competition within the business as well, you're going to make it extra hard for you to be successful. So marketing is the answer. And if you get it right, then that poison that this lady is injecting into the apple is actually medicine for the organization to grow and to get the um, rewards that uh, will ensue from implementing sales and marketing collaboration or marketing. So I would like you to consider this. Think about where in your organization you could run a marketing pilot program. You know, it doesn't need to be an, a, a big bang approach. It doesn't need to have to be, a, you know, close all bets. You have the choice of just saying, mm, let's just try it out in some part of the organization and see how we go and take the learnings from that pilot and then apply it to the larger organization. So if you think about where in your organization could, you could run a marketing pilot program, let me know. I'll be very happy to help you with that. And that's it from me. Thanks very much. I will now take some questions. Over to you.